Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Ajax Public Library's program, Financial Literacy and Gambling, from Investments to Money Misconceptions, presented by the YMCA. My name is Julia Campbell, and I'm the Adult Services Librarian at the Ajax Library. Um, so just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Tonight's presentation is being recorded, so I'd ask that you please keep your webcam and microphones off so that you are not displayed or heard in the recording. And we will have a Q&A portion after the presentation, so if you have any questions for our presenter, Sarah, at any point, please put them in the chat. And we also have closed captioning of our program today, so if you would like to turn on the captions, you can do so by clicking live transcript at the bottom and then show subtitles. And if you experience any technical difficulties, I recommend that you exit the Zoom and re-enter. And if you continue to have issues, please place a comment in the chat and I will do my best to assist you. So now it is my pleasure to introduce our presentation for this evening, which is with Sarah Hannaford, Youth Outreach Worker with the Youth Gambling Awareness Program. Um, so the YMCA Youth Gambling Awareness Program is a free service funded by the Ontario Ministry of Health designed to raise awareness with regards to gambling, healthy, active living, and making informed decisions. So today's workshop will provide a comprehensive look at how gambling can impact personal finances, including a discussion on gambling debt and bankruptcy. And we will also explore some of the unconventional ways in which gambling exists in the financial market, such as day trading and stock market apps. Um, so without further ado, I will now turn it over to Sarah to begin in her presentation. Thank you so much for that introduction, for having me. Um, yeah, so hi everyone. Uh, good evening, afternoon. I don't know what you call the time of the day. Um, my name is Sarah and like Julia was mentioning, I am the youth outreach worker for Durham Region for YMCA's Youth Gambling Awareness Programs. So we talk about gambling through a lot of different lenses, but today we're going to be talking about financial literacy and how it relates to gambling, because gambling definitely has that financial component that goes along with that. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, and delve into some of the crossover that can happen between those two subjects. So before we delve into our, com our conversation today, I just want to give you a little bit more information about our program and sort of our approach to gambling. So as a program, we are gambling neutral. And really, that means that we're trying to offer that balanced perspective, right? So I'm definitely not going to talk only about the, the pros of gambling. I'm also not going to talk about how it's a bad thing to do. I'm kind of going to offer that, that middle ground and just talk, have an open and honest conversation about some of the risks and some of the potentials that can come out of gambling. And if you do choose to do it, how we can do it as safe as possible. And really, that's our harm reduction approach. So we're just trying to reduce some of the potential harms that can come with engaging with gambling, because we know that there are risks associated with it. We just want to make sure that if folks are participating, they're able to do it as safely as possible. OK, and I will just give a little note that our presentations are quite interactive. So I would love to hear from you if you are wanting to unmute yourself, or definitely you can put your answers in the chat, and I will be monitoring that as well. But I have a bit of a poll here for you, and it kind of gets us starting to think about financial literacy. So in January 2014, the Bank of Montreal held a poll to find out how Canadians are saving for the retirement. So which of the following do you think are actual results from the survey? So did 49% say they would sell their homes and assets? Did 40% say they are counting on an inheritance? 34% are hoping for a lottery win? Or did 28% say that they are depending on family members and children to take care of them? So what do folks think? Yeah, so I'm seeing in the chat hoping for a lottery win sell their homes and assets, question mark. Yeah, totally. So those are great guesses. And I always feel like this, this, this is a little, it's, it's a little funny to start off with this because really the answer is all of these are correct. So actually in this poll that was done by the Bank of Montreal, these were all actual survey results. So all of these numbers were factual. And really what that shows us is that most Canadians are actually relying on factors that are outside of their control to prepare for retirement. So an obvious example of that is through the lottery. The lottery is unfortunately, it's quite risky, right? We know it's based on chance, not skills. So we're never sure if that's going to be something that comes our way. So we can never fully guarantee that we're going to have that as a means of income in the future. 
Um, but even with some of those other ones as well, right? Like depending on family members, we're not entirely sure what our fa family's financial situation is going to be. So a lot of the factors that were found in this poll really showed us that a lot of times when we think about financial literacy, we're kind of relying on factors that are a little bit out of our control or we're hoping things are gonna go in our direction. But that's why we kind of like think it's important to talk about financial risk uh, literacy because we know if we start looking at some things that are more within our control and some ways that we can implement some safety measures within our own lives, we can kind of help reduce that risk and keep our financial situation more within the confines of what we can control. Because sometimes when we think, when we look at those options from the list before, those are things that we don't always have the most control over. They, they can happen, they can not, but financial literacy really just looks at what we can do and what we can do to protect ourselves and take care of ourselves. Okay, and I'm sure we're all coming in with our own understandings of what financial literacy is, but just today when I'm talking about it, I'm really trying to, to come up with the understanding that it, it's having the knowledge and skills needed to manage money and make informed financial decisions, just like we were talking about, knowing how we can control the money that we have and make decisions that best fit into our lives and keep us safe and keep our family members safe. Okay, and I'm sure we're also coming in with our own understandings of gambling, but I will just spend a moment and define what we define gambling at at YGAP because it's actually a little bit different than the legal definition. So at YGAP, we say gambling is when you risk something of value and you don't know if you will win or lose. And what makes it a little bit different is that risking something of value piece. So today we're going to be talking a lot about finances and about money, and definitely gambling has that huge financial component. But we also know with gambling, it doesn't have to just be risking money. So in our program, we work with youth as well, and oftentimes youth don't have access to a lot of money. So things that they might be risking are their Pokemon cards or food or their, their snacks at lunchtime or things like that. And even when we get older, right, we might be risking like our, our, our home or things that have a hold value to us in, in, in our home or our phone or things like that. So although definitely gambling has that financial component we kind of take it a little bit further and we say when it's really when you're risking anything of value it doesn't just have to be money and then similarly to what gambling might you know your understanding of gambling it's when we're putting it into a chance-based situation so it's when we're putting it into a space and we're not sure if we're going to win or lose that's when we consider it a gambling activity so we'll just look at some common types of gambling so these are things um, like casino games, sports pools, card games, dice games, lottery, scratch tickets, bingo, horse racing, and internet gambling, which is really just any kind of gambling that we do on the internet. So these more common types of gambling are a lot more regulated, right? Like I think um, besides cards game and dice games that we are able to play with our family, we can maybe play when we're a little bit younger. Oftentimes with these, lots of these activities, we have to go places and they're a little bit more regulated. So oftentimes we have to be that legal gambling age, which is 18. We have to be able to enter into the premises and there's sort of more rules around how much uh, like what we what we can do there how old we can be and things like that so those are sort of the more common types of gambling oh well, in our program we also talk a lot about unconventional types of gambling so these are forms of gambling that might not be as regulated they might not even be understood really socially as forms of gambling but if you take our definition they kind of fall under that so these are things like buying a raffle ticket um, playing daily fantasy sports placing a bet on a dare or a challenge, playing for keeps, which I used to do all the time on the playground, um, risking points, gems, or coins in a video game for a chance to advance or win something, risking something of value on the outcome of a sports game, so any form of sports betting, and then also the stock market, which sometimes is an interesting one to, to talk about because there's definitely layers to the stock market, right? And not just, just generally participating in the stock market isn't necessarily a form of gambling. But sometimes we say it can be an unconventional form because the performance of a stock that you purchase is a little bit out of the buyer's control. Like the buyer can do research and there are definitely stocks that sort of have less of that risk factor. But especially with things such as day trading where you're buying and selling that stock within the same day, those factors are quite out of your control and you're not entirely sure what the outcome is going to be. Um, so just a little bit more information on the stock market. So really how, like in a very, very sort of basic terms, how it works, the consumer can buy or sell a share of a company at a stock exchange. And really that share is gonna be dictated by the number of people that are interested in buying or selling that share. So if there's a lot of people interested that the, the price of that share is going to go up, but if there's not a lot of people interested, the price of the share is going to go down. That's sort of how that the price, it's really dictated by the market. 
Um, and like I was mentioning, our participation in the stock market can kind of be understood as a form of gambling if we're participating in some more of those risky activities like day trading, or even if we're buying a stock and we're just never sure what that outcome is going to be. Sometimes companies surprise us, sometimes they go up in price, and sometimes, you know, we think that they're very stable and unfortunately something happens and that stock price plummets. So there's sort of that risk factor that goes alongside with gambling where we're risking something of value, oftentimes our money that we're investing, and we're not entirely sure if we're going to win or lose. We're hoping for the best with the stocks that we're investing in. Um, but there is that that potential that we might actually feel a bit of that negative repercussion, right? And we might end up losing some money. So that's one of the ways that we kind of see that the stock market can kind of form as a form of gambling. But we also know that there are the introduction of a lot of trading apps that exist that have begun to introduce gambling-like features. So what I mean by these uh, these these apps, these trading apps, they're you may have heard or you may be participating on them. They're called, well, there's some examples are well simple, Robin Hood apps like that. And they make it really accessible and really easy to participate in the stock market, which is great for if, you know, if we're trying to get, if we don't necessarily have all of the means to participate other ways, it's really great to have this accessibility on the app. Um, and like I was mentioning, what you can do in the stock market, you can really just buy and sell any kind of stocks on these apps. But what we have found is oftentimes these apps can kind of incorporate gambling-like activities or things that are similar to gambling-like activities. So some gambling activities are, you know, gambling activities are often used as social events. They're often very social situations. You go to the casino as a group, you're able to sort of feel that camaraderie. Um, gambling activities also offer incentives to keep players playing. So they want us to continue to play and purchase and spend money. So there will be incentives along that way that will sort of keep us in that game if we're for playing. Um, gambling activities will also use colors and sounds to create a fun experience and they'll celebrate a player's success. They'll make us feel great when we're winning because that is very exciting um, and maybe it will sort of make us want to keep coming back. And this kind of crosses over to a lot of these trading apps. So this we can look at, at kind of some of the similarities between the two. So at a lot of the trading apps we are seeing this encouragement to invite friends to trade with and so I know with Wealth Simple, there's some even like financial incentives that go along with that, where if you invite a friend, that friend might get $20 to spend in the stock market. So we're seeing that kind of incentive show up as well. Um, we're also seeing, like I was mentioning, you might offer that, that free cash to purchase stocks. So that might be through having someone in, inviting someone, but sometimes just when we sign up, there are those added incentives um, where we might be offered that free cash. And that's kind of similar to sometimes with, um, especially internet gambling, we might have the opportunity to play one time for free or have one spin on the wheel or one, uh, one go at the slot machine for free. And then once we keep playing, we're going to have to pay, but there's sort of that initial item that's a little bit free or of lower cost. Uh, we also know on stock trading apps, um, they light up with different colors if the stock goes up and down, kind of making it seem a little bit more like a game where if it's in the green, that's really great. It can be really exciting, but if it's in the red, um, you know, we might feel a little bit of stress, but it's also kind of playing into this idea that it's more of a game, whereas oftentimes, you know, that's really our money that's putting, that's being put there. And then we also see, similarly to with gambling, where we see a celebration of players' success, we're also seeing a lot of fun graphics show up where they're going to celebrate successful investments. And I know on some, I think this has actually been changed um, due to some criticism that was received, but there was like a little, what's the word I'm looking for? Little uh, fireworks that would show up, which obviously feels really great to see, especially when it has things to do with our finances, since that's the same with gambling. When we see really exciting kind of celebrations show up around winning, it can feel really great. But just the same as with stocks and with gambling, oftentimes we are putting our money into those situations. So when we're winning, that can feel really great. But it's also important to remember that all, both of these spaces, there are risks associated with it, and we're never guaranteed that win, right? We might also have losses that come for that. So it's important to, for us to kind of be mindful of that and also be mindful of the ways that the stock market and gambling can kind of um, overlap, especially when we think about the gamification of the stock market. Oh yeah, and I'm seeing in the chat, definitely please, if there's any questions along the way, um, please feel free to interrupt me or put questions in the chat. I am more than happy to, to go over anything a little bit more if anyone has any questions or wants me to talk a little bit more about anything. Okay, so I have another question for you all, and I, I'm wondering which of Canada's five largest banks um, do you think allow customers to make online casino transactions? So which of the banks presented on the screen, so BMO, RBC, TD, Scotiabank, and CIBC, do you think allow customers to make online casino transactions? So I'm seeing in the chat CIBC. Mm 
none. All of them. Oh, so we've got a bit of a range there. So yeah, with this one, we actually find it's only BMO. So only BMO will allow um, customers to make online casino transactions. And I'll go through and we'll talk a little bit about all the specifics of each of the five Canada's five major banks and their relationship with um, casino tra online casino transactions. So we have a little bit more of an understanding. But like I was mentioning, yeah, BMO is really the only bank that allows online gambling transactions. So any kind of online gambling transaction is allowed by BMO. For uh, Scotiabank and CIBC, both banks can reject gambling transactions. So there's that potential they might go through, but they have the ability to reject those transactions. So it's not sort of blanket yes. There's some discretion that goes into that one. Um, for Scotia banks, they only allow online gambling with Crown corporations. So there's that specificness that goes into what is allowed by Scotia Bank. And TD doesn't allow any gambling transactions. So TD has more of the strictest policy where no um, gambling transactions are allowed. So this really just does show us that there different banks have a lot of different requirements and different rules surrounding gambling. And if you are trying to make an online gambling transaction or play a uh, play a game online, and you're wondering sort of if your bank will allow it. It might not. There are. It depends what bank you go with, but different banks do have different sort of specific requirements. So it's always good to look into what your specific bank is, especially if you are looking to make that online payment or make that online transaction, just to make sure that your payment would be able to go through. Okay, and so we'll we'll talk as well about what is the safest option for getting money into the casino. So. We know the biggest banks exist, but there's also all sorts of different ways that we can get money into the casino. So these are cryptocurrency, prepaid cards, uh, third-party accounts, and other methods such as credit, debit, um, and instant banking. So I'll go through all of the different examples, and then I'll ask you sort of what your opinion is on what you think would be the safest option. So I'll start with prepaid credit cards. So prepaid credit cards, they're really reloadable cards that can be used to make oops, um, used to make offline and online purchases. and Oftentimes you can get these at places like shoppers and they're really, they're not connected to a user's bank account. So what that means is that the vendor, whoever it is that you're using the prepaid credit card with, they don't have access to your personal information. It's sort of, they just have access to the card, but it's really not linked to you at all. Um, another thing is casino winnings cannot be put back onto these cards. So they're not able to sort of have that reciproca reciprocation on back onto the card. And something that is important to note, often with these cards, there is an activation cost. And if you continue to use them, there will be a monthly fee. So they do have, even if you're sort of purchasing them for an outright price, there might be some, some additional costs that go into using the card. So that's just a good thing to note. But this is one of the ways that we know money can be brought into the casinos with a prepaid credit card. Another one is with a third party account. So this is a device or service that acts as an intermediary between a bank and a vendor. So an example of a vendor would be, you know, a gambling website. So these really work very similarly to prepaid cards, but winnings can be deposited back into them. So with a prepaid credit card, you can have your winnings be put back onto the card, but with a third party account, it can be put back onto the card. Uh, but that being said, it does provide an extra layer of security because it creates a bit more of a barrier between your information and the vendor. So it's not necessarily your immediate banking information there's sort of that third party account so there's a bit of a bridge between you and that vendor creating a bit more safety around your own personal identity and your information that goes along with that so another way that money can be put into online uh, gambling corporations and to be used to play gambling on gambling games online is through cryptocurrency so what cryptocurrency this is again a pretty uh, basic uh, sort of explanation of what it is, but it's kind of an encrypted digital currency that's stored in internet databases. So what that means is really the value of these currencies, it really fluctuates based on supply and demand. So how we were talking about with the stocks about how, depending on who is interested in buying them, how many people are interested in buying them versus how many people are looking to sell them, that is kind of dictating the price. We see that as well as cryptocurrency. There's really not a regulation over what the sort of price is going to be or what the value of a cryptocurrency of the different currencies are it really is it fluctuates greatly based on the supply and demand so if it's a really in demand currency then it the value will go up but similarly that could change it really can fluctuate so it's very much dependent on the market um, it's important to note that in Canada cryptocurrency is not considered a legal tender but um, so that means that RBC and TD and Scotia planks will block cryptocurrency purchases using credit. So that's another thing that's just, if you are looking to invest 
different banks do have different policies around that. So once again, it's great to kind of look in the specific policies of your banks because like I was mentioning here, RBC, TD, and Scotiabank will block those cryptocurrency purchases. Um, so not all online gambling sites will allow for cryptocurrency. Like I was mentioning, it's not actually legal in, um, or it's not actually a, ten, uh, a legal tender in Canada. So it's really only some of the offshore online gambling sites that will allow for them. Um, so that's another thing that's important to note if you are thinking of bringing this form of currency into the casino. Uh, and one of the things, one of the myths that's important to kind of unpack when we talk about cryptocurrency is often it's really linked with anonymity because we're talking about how it's kind of a virtual currency. There's often this understanding that you're not connected to the currency at all and your information isn't connected to the currency, but that's actually not true. You know, each transaction is actually linked to a user's IP address. So there is that direct link to your information. So if you're thinking about protecting yourself and your information, Sometimes when we talk about cryptocurrency, the way it's pitched is it really is sort of pitched as this very anonymous form of currency, but there are ways of identifying yourself through this currency. So it's just good to know if that is something that you are looking to invest in or engage in, just to know that it's not as anonymous as sometimes it's spoken about or sort of the common rhetoric around it might be, might be saying. Okay, and so here are some other methods. So we have debit. Oftentimes this can be done through some of the big banks, but this is a transaction where money is directly taken from a person's account. So there's not really that, that gap in between you and the vendor. The vendor knows exactly who you are and vice versa. Um, we have credit. Similarly, there's no gap between that and what credit is. Um, it's borrowing money to make a payment. So money that you don't already have, that you're borrowing to make that payment. And then we also have instant banking. So alternative methods to send money from a bank account to an online casino. So these are things like bank wires, e-checks, all sorts of things like this. And all of these forms of um, getting money, like all of these methods can be used to bring money into an online casino. So you can use your credit card or a debit card or instant banking method. So they're all able to, there's, not a, there's no restrictions on using these forms of getting money into it, using these methods to get money into a casino, I should say. Um, and I guess more of a note on instant banking. So a little bit different than how the name might suggest. It's good for us to be aware that not all instant banking methods are in fact instant. So things like a bank wire can actually take up to a week to process. And also payments with these methods can't be reversed. And there's usually a fee for canceling a payment. So that's good to know just in case, you know, if that is something that you're looking to do, there might be that time, that time that goes into it. And as well, if it's a payment that you're not entirely sure about, they're not usually able to be reversed and there is going to be a fee associated with it. And it's also important to note that these kinds of methods are highly susceptible to fraud and hacking. So there is that risk that goes along with them as well. So my question to you, now that we've gone through kind of all the methods that we're able to get money into the casino, which method do you think is the safest? Which one would be the best way to protect yourself, do you think? The third party, yeah, definitely. Just give it a few more moments to see if anyone else wants to share. Yeah, so we actually say, we say prepaid credit cards are the safest method, but very similarly to the third party accounts, the reason we say that is because it's creating that barrier between you and the vendor. So you are protecting your personal information and you're also protecting yourself from fraud. So the reason why we say this is, you know, you're able to protect yourself from fraud because your prepaid credit card is really not linked to your individual credit or debit account. So, or any of your banking information. So you have that protection for you. Um, the other reason that we say that is because with prepaid credit cards, if we think about it in a, in a protection layer, you're able to protect yourself. But another real added bonus of a prepaid credit card is you're really able to set a budget. So the thing with a prepaid card is you're only able to access that money, you're only able to access money that has been loaded onto it by the user. So if you go into the casino and you are only wanting to spend $300, let's just say, you are only, and then you load that onto your prepaid credit card, you know that at the end of the night when you're walking away, you have only been able to spend that amount of money. You don't have that ability with a credit or a debit card to kind of 
go a little bit more over. You don't have access to sort of your larger sum or whatever your larger income source. You're sort of really limited to that amount of money you brought in with you. So not only is it protecting your personal information, but it's also helping you kind of, it's keeping you accountable to a budget you might get, you might, you're, you might have set prior to that. Um, another great thing about it is if it's stolen or if it's hacked, you're only really losing that amount of money. So as much as it always doesn't feel great to lose any amount of money, it's much better to kind of only have lost $300 rather than your full, whatever sitting in your full account or be have that risk of losing what might be in your full account. So that's why we say prepaid credit cards, but definitely third party accounts in that the fact that they create a barrier are also one of our safer options as well. We just always wanna recommend kind of creating a bit more of a barrier between you and the vendor because it helps protect your personal information. But one of the real added bonuses about prepaid credit cards is it also helps you set in place that budget. Okay, so we're gonna do a few challenging misconceptions about financial literacy. So I'm going to read out a statement and you're gonna let me know if you think the answer is true or false. So my first statement is gambling is a reliable way to earn money. So do we think it's true, false, let me know. Yeah, so I'm seeing in the chat false. Another person saying false and someone else saying false. Yeah, yeah, so I completely agree. Um, definitely, when we think about gambling, we really wanna stray away from thinking it as a form of income or a reliable way to earn money. Gambling, first and foremost, is really a form of entertainment, right? Um, and the thing that kind of makes it entertainment is it's, it's, it's chance-based. So the outcome of a gambling game is really out of our control. And more than that, the number of wins that we might actually experience are quite limited. And Oftentimes this is due to what we refer to as the house edge, which basically just is illustrating that the house, so the gambling company, the, or the operation, the, whoever is sort of running whatever gambling activity you're participating in, they have to take in more money at the end of the day because they're a business and that is their main goal. So oftentimes, although there will be payouts, the payouts are gonna be a lot less than the amount of money that the house is going to take in, meaning that the number of wins for players are going to be quite limited. So. Really what this is just telling us is that gambling is definitely something that can be really fun. There's that entertainment component definitely that goes along with it, but we wanna really stray away from thinking about as a reliable way to earn money because we can never guarantee that win. So if we look at sort of the odds of different kind of situations, it really helps situate sort of how the number of odds are quite limited. So, you know, just as a quick refresher, odds are really referring to the chances of winning compared to the chances of losing. So if we look at the odds of being struck by lightning or about one in 200,000, the odds of becoming a movie star, I'm gonna round up, but we're at about one, or round down, I guess, but we're about 1 million. Uh, the odds of winning a share of a lotto 649 jackpot are one in 14 million. And the odds of winning a share of the lotto max jackpot are one in 33 million. So really for every one winner, there's going to be about 33 million players who are going to lose. And that doesn't mean that it can't be a really fun thing to do, or it doesn't mean that we shouldn't participate, but it helps us kind of situate the likelihood of us winning and helps us keep in mind that when we are participating, if we are buying a lot of max card, a lot of, if we're, yeah, if we're buying a lottery card, or if we are choosing to participate, it's more so out of thinking of it as a form of entertainment, less so out of the likelihood that we are going to win, because we know in a lot of the games that we are going to play often, the odds are not in our favor. And I always am really, it really strikes home with me with the being struck by lightning. Cause to me, that feels like a super, like that feels so unlikely to happen to me. I feel like that's very, very far away. But the fact that that's so much more likely than winning a share of the Lotto Max jackpot just really helps, at least for me personally, put it into perspective and, and remind me just of how, how high the percentages of people who do walk away from buying a share of, the, of or of buying a lottery ticket who do walk away not winning. So it, it, it helps me at least put it a little bit in perspective. Okay, um, so using your credit card to gamble is just as safe as using cash. Do we think this is, do you guys think this is true or false? So I'm seeing in the chat, someone say false, someone else say false. Yeah, so sort of we're unanimous around false. And uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. So for this, the we are, we're talking about before about how credit cards or debit cards, when we're using our banking information, 
it's there's that fraud component, right? Where our, our personal information is being, there's there's that that risk that we could experience fraud. So there's that kind of safety piece that goes into it as well. But there's also just when we think about a credit card, which is money that we're borrowing, there's a really big risk of borrowing money to gamble because the whole, like we've been talking about with gambling, we really don't know if we're going to win or lose. So what the risk comes in is if we're not actually sure if we're going to be able to pay back that borrowed money, it can really affect our credit rating. Um, and we can might feel that negative impact. And as well, we might be charged quite a lot of interest. It depends on sort of the interest rate of our cards, but depending on if we're if we're using our credit card to gamble um, and we're not able to pay that full sum back come when our bill is due or come when we have to make our payment, um, we're going to get charged that interest. And then the longer it takes us to pay us back, the more affected our credit rating is going to be. So that's why we really do recommend sticking to money that we already have rather than borrowing money to gamble, just to kind of help our ease of mind and also just make sure that we're not we're not running that risk of of paying money of not being able to pay money back or of getting charged lots of interest on something that we didn't really want to get charged lots of interest on um so that's why we recommend using cash because that's money that we already have we don't have to to worry about how we're going to pay it back if we do end up losing it um and sort of the vocabulary we use to describe this is we recommend gambling from what we call our entertainment budget. So really that's all the money, that's when we've already had all the other things that we need to pay, so all of our mandatory expenses, and then kind of additional money that we have left over after that, that comes from our entertainment budget. So that's when we recommend, you know, we can use that money to gamble just as we would do all sorts of other fun things. And really what that's sort of doing is it's protecting us and it's making sure that all of our necessities have already been paid. It's also making sure that we don't go into debt to support our gambling habits, but doesn't isn't stopping us from participating in the activity should we want to do that. Um, and then this is just sort of something we like to say is, you know, it's good to treat the money spent on gambling like buying a movie ticket. So, you know, when you go to the movies, you're not really expecting to get that money back. You're buying the movie ticket and you're gonna go have that experience of being at the movie and then you're going to leave and that will have been your form of entertainment. So that's the kind of same mentality we like to apply to gambling where you're spending a certain amount of money on a specific activity um, and you might win something back, but we should never really assume that we're going to because there is that possibility we're going to lose, but we can still have a good time doing it. So that's the sort of mentality we like to, to, to refer to when we're talking about gambling. Um, and I always find this slide interesting because it really just looks at the cost of using $300 cash a debit or credit in a casino. And it kind of shows us some of the fees that might be associated with the different forms of the different methods of bringing money into the casino. Uh, so, you know, with cash, we have just that straight up cost. We only have $300, so we're not um, being charged anything extra. With debit card, with a debit, if we do go to the casino and we want to take out money, we're going to be charged that ATM fee. We're also going to be charged a bank fee from our bank, because oftentimes the ATM at the casino is not going to be the ATM of our bank, so our bank is going to charge us a little fee for using that. So then we're going to have $5 extra, let's just say. I actually think oftentimes it's a little bit higher, but for the purposes of this, it's saying that we're going to be charged about $5 extra. Um, if we use our credit card, so we have that same experience, so we have that ATM fee, we have that bank fee, but now we're also being charged interest. So with our credit card, that expectation is, you know, we're, we're borrowing that money, the expectation is we're going to pay it back, but we're going to pay it back with a little bit of extra. So we're going to be charged interest as well. And then with a payday loan, which is a short-term loan with high, um, high interest rates, we're being charged a very high interest, right? We're being charged about $51 for this. And we're also being charged service fees. So those are late fees. If we're not able to pay the, make our payment back on time, we're gonna be charged that as well. So what that can mean is we're being, we're actually spending about 91 extra dollars. So it just does help us keep in mind that the different methods of getting money into a casino, and we can kind of apply this to a lot of different aspects in our life, the different methods that we use to make payments have different costs associated with them. So it's always great to be mindful about what methods we are using, what costs might be associated. And then when we're making our budget or when we're thinking about our budget, factoring that in, because sometimes those additional costs can kind of get a little left out and we might not be as cognizant that we're having them. So then come the end of the month when we're looking at the amount of money we spend, it might have sort of slipped in there and, and raised sort of our, our monthly expenses. So it's good just to be knowledgeable about the different costs that are associated with the methods of payments that we are using. Um, and we, I, we mentioned credit and there are lots of different kind of credit options that we can use, but casinos actually do have their own line of credit. So really what this is, it's kind of a preset amount of money that a patron or a player 
can borrow from the casino. And there are some specific requirements or specific rules that are put in place for borrowing this line of credit. So oftentimes they are interest free. So they are, they, there, are there isn't going to be that interest charge on it. But there is a short amount of time that it's asked to repay. So oftentimes it's that expectation of being repaid within 30 days. And if a patron is unable to repay it, a collection agency will be used. So it, although there may not be interest, there is that sort of repercussion that might come from that. Um, another thing about a casino line of credit is that money can't be used anywhere else outside of the casino. So it's really only allowed to be used within the specific casino. And there also is that risk with the casino line of credit of spending more than intended. Similarly to what we were talking about with credit cards, line of credit is really falls under that same same category of we are borrowing money and we're not, we, there is that risk that goes along with that. Um, but also when we're only able to spend it in a specific location, there's a risk that goes along with that well. So this is one of those other methods that exist. Um, and it's good to kind of know how that works, but also what are the risks that are associated with it as well. Okay. Um, ooh, my thing is being covered. Um, gambling is a want, not a need. So do we think that this is true or false? Do I see someone in the chat say true? I see someone else say true. False if addicted. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, that that's sort of what what we say as well. So we kind of talk about how gambling exists on a spectrum, our relationship with gambling. So each individual is on a spectrum when it comes to gambling. And either we don't gamble, maybe we're recreational gamblers, but we might also experience problem gambling or experience an addiction to gambling. Um, so if we exist on the spectrum and we are recreational gamblers, if we're just using it as a fun source of entertainment, yes, definitely gambling is more so of a want. We don't need it for our lives. But it can be experienced as a need if a person develops a gambling addiction. So I definitely agree with, yeah, both people in the chat. It really depends on where we are on that spectrum and our personal relationship with gambling. But if we are experiencing that addiction, gambling does then become begin to um, be experienced as a need. Whereas if we are recreational gamblers, we might be experiencing it more as a want. So this does differ person to person, depending on our own personal situations. So when we talk about problem gambling, these, there are a few general warning signs. And it's always important to note that whenever there comes to warning signs, this, this is by no means a comprehensive list. We all experience, um, we all experience things differently. And so if, you know, it depends, totally depends on the individual situation. Someone might experience a problem with gambling much different than someone else. Addiction is very personal. So that's just something that's important to note before I go into this. But that being said, there are some just general warning signs that we can speak to that are just good to be mindful of for, for you and for other people in your life. So sort of general warning signs that we find with problem gambling. And that's really when we feel as though gambling is beginning to negatively impact our life. So this is maybe the inability to stop um, keep paying to win back losses. So winning back losses or chasing losses is a term that's used around this kind of concept. And really what it means is if we are losing money or maybe we have sort of lost the amount of money that we're uncomfortable with, we can sometimes feel or folks can feel as though um, if we keep playing, we might be able to win back that money. Uh, there's that idea that, you know, if we lose a certain times in a row, we might be guaranteed that win. Unfortunately, this isn't usually the case. Um, we never know we're guaranteed a win. So what can happen there is we might end up losing more money that we're comfortable with. So if we feel as though we're really chasing our losses, if we're keep putting back to win back losses, maybe it's just something that we want to, to look into a little bit more. Um, if we're feeling that need, expecting to win and needing to win, um, also if gambling is interfering with other aspects of our life. So if it's interfering with our work or our relationships or anything like that, if we're feeling those negative repercussions spill into different aspects of our life. So these, those are some sort of general warning signs of perhaps what problem gambling could look like. But we also like to talk about what some safe gambling practices that can be put in place to help us sort of deal with gambling in a way that kind of protects us a little bit more. So some safe gambling practices can be sticking with our money and our time limit, like we were mentioning. Money limits are super helpful because I've totally been in a situation where I've gotten caught up and I haven't really stuck to the budget that I set before going and it feels it really doesn't feel good. And especially if we're doing that often, it can feel very, it can start to feel a little bit like we're, we're 
we're losing control over our financial situation. So if we're sticking with a money but uh, a money limit and we have sort of figured out how much money we are comfortable spending that night and we go into the casino and we use a prepaid card or even we just take out that amount of cash and we go in with that, that can sort of help protect us and can help us keep us accountable to whatever that budget that we wanted to set. Um, like I was mentioning, yeah, ad adhering to the budget and avoiding using credit to gamble is a great way to do that. Knowing the odds and hoping to win, but expecting to lose is also helpful. Um, and similarly with all sorts of different things, right? Balancing gambling activities with other areas in our lives. So we always want to make sure that we have a lot of different things that we're using to sort of cope with our lives, things that are bringing us joy. So it's good to sort of balance our gambling activities with the different activities that we might enjoy doing as well. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about bankruptcy in Ontario because, and it's by no means to say that participating in gambling leads to bankruptcy, but we know that that is one of the potential risks. So it's good for us to have that knowledge around. So really what bankruptcy is, is it's a legal process that allows the person to discharge most of their debts. So um, really what happens is once you file for bankruptcy, all assets and credit cards of that person are surrendered. So that means that you relinquish your house and your car and your credit cards and you don't have, you don't own those assets anymore. Um, there's also monthly payments that are expected to be made for nine to 21 months. And something that's also important to note is actually not all debts are automatically discharged through bankruptcy. So by declaring bankruptcy, it doesn't automatically mean that all debts are going to be discharged. There are some differences that go to the different kind of debts that have been accumulated. So there are specifics that go into that. So it doesn't automatically mean that all of the debts are going to be just discharged just because um, someone has filed for bankruptcy. And like I was mentioning, there is a link between gambling debt and bankruptcy. So we actually do know gambling is one of the eight most common reasons for bankruptcy in Canada. Um, in a specific situation where we're seeing gambling debt and bankruptcy, the person who is seeking bankruptcy will have to have their case assessed by a judge. Um, and like I was mentioning, not all um, debts are gonna automatically be discharged and bankruptcy caused by gambling debts is one of those ones which may not be automatically discharged. So that's something that's important to know. And also debt that may be discharged, there might be some additional terms and conditions that go along with that. So that could be completing a gambling counseling program, paying a portion of gambling debts, et cetera. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they won't be discharged. It just means that there might be some of those additional terms and conditions that go along with that, just to sort of help support people as well moving forward. So bankruptcy looks a little different depending on different situations. And sometimes it can kind of be talked to as sort of a universal process, but there are some differences that depend on the individual situation. And one of those differences can kind of come up if one of the reasons for declaring bankruptcy is through an accumulation of gambling debt. Okay, um, so problem gambling only impacts a person's finances. Do we think this is true or false? Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of people in the chat say false. Yeah, and, and definitely. So problem gambling addiction, it, there's we're really not experienced. It's not only that impact on finances, right? Um, it can, it's sort of just when our person's gambling behavior is affecting their life in a negative way. So this might be felt through their finances, but it can also impact relationships, performance at work, psychological and physiological health. So um, problem gambling is experienced in all sorts of different facets in life. So it doesn't necessarily just only have to be experienced financially. There might be that financial, um, there might be financial situations that are occurring due to problem gambling, but it might be also experienced in a lot of different facets as well. So it's not just limited to impacts on a person's finances, definitely. Um, and disordered gambling is often referred to as a silent addiction. Do we think that this is true or false? Yeah, I'm seeing someone in the chat say, say true, a lot of people saying true. And I, yeah, I completely agree. So this one is true. So we do know that a problem, someone experiencing a gambling addiction, the, the impacts of that can be experienced as all sorts of, as all sorts of different addictions we can, you know, experience problems with drugs, problems with alcohol. Um, and they share a lot of similarities with other addictive 
uh, disorders. But the thing with a gambling addiction is oftentimes there's not a lot of physical signs or physical changes that can indicate that someone is experiencing a gambling problem. So what that can mean for folks who are experiencing is oftentimes they can feel that in isolation. Um, and it can cause a lot of, it can cause, it has that potential to cause great financial and emotional harm before anyone around them might realize that they exist. Because oftentimes the impacts might be felt more in a personal level. And especially when we think about the financial impacts, if we think about those, you oftentimes were felt that that's much more of a personal situation. Oftentimes that's not sort of broadcasted to those around us, but even the emotional impacts as well, those might be really felt in isolation. Um, so that's often why it's referred to as a silent addiction because it can kind of go unnoticed by folks around them um, just due to the fact that there aren't those physical changes or visible signs that often go, in, go coincide with it. So that brings me to the end of sort of what I have to talk about today. Just before we leave, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about a few different help and referral organizations that exist. Uh, just because it's always great to kind of know what is out there for you if you're ever interested or for anyone else in your life. So one of the ones that we really like to mention is Connex Ontario. So they're a drug, alcohol, mental health, and problem gambling line. They're a really great resource to know about. You can access them both online and through the phone. They have a number that you can call. And they sort of serve as kind of a middleman. So they're both there to kind of support you through any situation or support anyone through any situation and sort of be a listening ear but they also have access to a really large database, which has all sorts of information on um, re resources that exist. So it's confidential in the fact you don't share your name or your age, but what you do share often if you're comfortable is your location. And then they're able to look that up in their database and connect you with local resources that are near you. So that can be support groups, residential programs, whatever it is specifically that you might be looking for, or you might be interested in knowing more about, they have access to all that information. So if you're ever unsure of sort of where to go to or where to begin with, Connex Ontario is a really great place to know about. Um, and as well, if there are youth in your life, um, resources that we really like to recommend to youth are Kids Help Phone and Good to Talk. Um, you may have already heard of these. They're really great resources to know about. They're also free and confidential. Um, and they're really great because youth can call with really any problem. It doesn't matter what it is. If they're really experiencing any distress about anything, they're able to call and they're connected with a licensed therapist. So they're able to be supported through that and be given some tools on how best to address the situations that they're in. Um, and we also have some more specific financial literacy resources that we like to recommend. Um, and I know uh, Julia was mentioning, I'll, 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 I'll send these to her afterwards. So you'll have access to these uh, prior to our, like post our workshop if you're ever interested in referring back to them. But these include ABC Life Literacy Canada, uh, the Canadian Foundation for Economic Education. One that I personally have used and have really great experience with is Credit Canada. They have a really great sort of tool where you can, they basically format a budget for you. So it's very user effect. It's very um, accessible. It's very easy to use. And they just kind of help you work through the budgeting, um, especially if, if you've had a change in your financial situation or you're looking at different situations. They're a really great resource to know about. Um, and they also offer a lot of webinars as well. So they, they have a lot of information that sort of talks about a lot of different things and about making kind of conversations around credit a lot more accessible. There's also practical money skills, which looks into that as well. Um, and then there's a few different apps that if you're ever interested in kind of implementing some easy ways of, of budgeting or of tracking your expenses, these are some good apps that can be helpful in doing that. So we have some dollar saving apps, so things like Flip, Gas Buddy, which I use, especially with that increase in gas prices, it can be helpful to kind of survey the situation and see. Um, where you might be able to find the cheapest options. Uh, also tracking expenses apps. So budget, good budget, and YNAP are also good ones to know about. And yeah, so that brings me to the end of what I have to talk about today. Um, I do have a quick evaluation of the workshop, which just lets me know if you learned anything or if there's anything you would change, which I will pop into the chat, but I also, want to definitely open it up if we have anyone has any questions about anything we talked about or comments um i'd be more than happy to discuss so i will pop that in the chat and definitely let me know um if you have any questions or comments i would love to hear from you i will stop thank you so you much um sarah um, so now I'm going to stop the recording and, and open it up for questions so people can feel free to put them in the chat or you can unmute um, and ask your questions or have comments that way.